I first read uh, the galleys that Dick Zanny gave me of the Peter Benchley book, Jaws, came back the next day, read it that night, came back the next day, and I said, I really want to direct this. I hope you can hire me. And uh, at the time, there was another director attached, and I wasn't, he said, I'm not going to be able to hire you. I wish I could, but there's somebody else involved making Jaws. And then circumstances prevailed where I had, did have a chance to direct Jaws a couple of months later. But I said, you know, I really want to make this because this is Duel of the Sea. Not only that, but a Polish poster of Duel that had the truck with a huge mouth like a shark. So the whole front of the truck was kind of open like it was about to scoop up the car. This summer is the location for one of America's biggest motion pictures, Jaws. Based on the novel by Peter Benchley, it's the bestseller in England at the moment. It's the story of how a killer shark marauds and threatens the lives and the livelihood of a small New England beach community. Making a feature film on dry land is a complex enough process. There seem to be at least three people for every job. Making a feature film at sea stops just short of a nightmare. It's the second day of American shooting on Jaws. They've already been to Australia for the underwater shots of the shark. Turn on the walkie-talkie, please, Freddy. We were called out to see the first shark test. The first time the shark was going to be in the water and was going to, you know, perform, you know, like Esther Williams. And, and so Dick Zanuck and David Brown and I were in a small uh, support boat. It was like a Boston whaler. And um, the shark came out of the water beautifully. I mean, it was supposed to broach, breach, and head first and explosion of water. And it did that. It came right out perfectly. And then the, the head kind of went back down like a submarine. And then there was an explosion of bubbles. And then the tail came up in the other direction, tail first. And then the tail sort of fell over that way. There was another explosion of bubbles. And then there was one final explosion of bubbles. Then it was eerily quiet. And we actually were witnessing the shark sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And at that point, uh, Dick and David turned to me, and Dick said, well, I'm sure they'll fix it by morning. And the next morning, we got the word that they were going to be down maybe three to four weeks with the shark. Uh, that's when I realized, okay, plan B. Now, I never planned for a plan B. But that Monday, I suddenly had to improvise a plan B, which was basically to make the film as scary as I possibly could by suggesting the shark without having to show the shark. And that became my motif for the rest of the picture. I say, you know, gee, the movie's really scary because my imagination saw more of the shark than you actually showed me. Well, part of that was, was intentional because I wanted, I thought I could scare people with just the ocean line and, and just the mystery of what's under the murky water. But also, the darn shark wouldn't come out of his dressing room for months. I mean, the thing never worked. The shark on Jaws works much better on the Universal Tour than it ever worked on Martha's Vineyard when I made Jaws. I thought I'd be fired all the time. I mean, there, there was even a rumbling that I was about to be fired. Uh, by the studio for basically being 100 days over schedule. It turned out that I was 100 days over schedule. It was the most over schedule I've ever been. And the budget went from like four to nine million dollars, which in those days, in 1974, that was a lot of money. Um, but I was saved by the, my friend Sid Scheinberg and Dick Sianic, David Brown. The, they, they said if I got fired, they quit. And they kind of saved me from losing the job. I, pro I promise you that if the shark had been working that first day and Chrissy Watkins had been taken in that first scene, and the way my storyboards had, I had a fin in that shot, I had a conical nose coming out of the water, never seen the whole shark, I had a tail. Had there been any evidence of the shark, even on the scene where the pier is pulled out and comes back again and chases the swimmer back in, the fisherman, I promise you the audience wouldn't have leapt three feet out of their seats and thrown their popcorn into the air when the shark came out when Roy Schotter was chumming. You wouldn't have had that shock. The shark not working when we needed it to work probably added $175 million to the box office. Because I think what's scary about that movie is, is the unseen, not exactly what we see. And when we do see the shark, it's shocking. Verna Fields, a tremendous film editor, would surgically cut a frame off the head of the shark and cut a frame off the tail of the shark. And those two frames made the difference between the shark looking like a great white 26-foot-long predator or looking like a 26-foot-long turd. The film stars Roy Scheider of The French Connection and Richard Dreyfuss of American Graffiti. The director said he faced the head of the studio and he said, I can't do it in time. But in the age of director as superstar, the movie will probably be sold on the latest American star behind the camera, Steven Spielberg. Jaws is one of the hottest properties in the film world this year. The book was an instant hit in America, 
in the film rights were commensurately costly. To shoot for 13 weeks at a budget of over a million pounds is something of a rarity these days, so the producers, Richard Zanuck and David Brown, must have a lot of faith in their property and even more in their director, Mr. Spielberg. Jaws to me was a near-death experience. I had a near career death experience. I went to a party at Martha's Vineyard. A very well-known actress came over to me and said, I just came back from L.A. Everybody says this picture is a complete stinker. It's a total failure, and nobody will ever hire you again because you're profitless and you're spending, and you're responsible, and everybody's calling you responsible. I had never heard the scuttle. I didn't ever hear the noise that was coming from Hollywood about me. And I was halfway through shooting the picture, and this person tells me that, that my movie's a disaster. And uh, I'm a disaster, and I'm, it's over. And I really believe for the second half of the film that this was uh, the last time I was ever going to shoot a film in 35 millimeters. That was it. That was it. I had always wanted to be in business with John Williams all my life. And when he said yes to Sugarland, we became friends. And obviously, I wanted him to do every picture I ever made. And Jaws came second. When he finally played the music for me on the piano, he previewed the main Jaws theme. I expected to hear something kind of weird and melodic, you know, and kind of tonal but eerie and of another world, almost a bit like outer space, inside, you know, inner space under, under the water. And, and what he played me instead with two fingers on the lower keys was dun, 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 dun. And at first I began to laugh. I thought he was, he had a great sense of humor. I thought he was putting me on. And, and he said, no, that's the theme that draws. And I said, play it again. He played it again. And he played it again, and it suddenly seemed right. And John found a signature for the entire movie. Yeah, everybody told me not to shoot on water. I mean, everybody said don't do it. Sid Scheinberg even said, well, I should build a tank on the back lot. We'll pay for it. And I said, no, I want to go out, and I want to battle the elements, and I want people to think this is really happening, that shark is really in the ocean, I want a real ocean. It was something that I will never forget. It was something that I don't want to repeat, and you probably noticed I haven't done very many water movies since Jaws. Jaws was, was horrendous for me. I don't want to sound ungrateful because I'm completely grateful to the audience embracing the movie and the movie being such a phenomenon, which basically gave me what I had always dreamed about was A, being a movie director, and B, having Final Cut, and Jaws gave me freedom.